Hi everyone, it's Professor Pemberton. In this video, we're going to finish up our discussion on logarithmic functions. So from the previous video, we left off at how to graph logarithmic functions. So remember in the previous video, we discussed the idea that if a function is one-to-one, -one, then that means the function has an inverse function. And we also discussed previously in the class that if a function has an inverse, then the domain of the function f of x is really the range of the inverse function and vice versa. The range of f of x is the domain of the inverse. So let's go back and review exponential functions. Exponential functions, the domain was the set of all real numbers because the exponent is where the variable is located and the exponent can be any real number. That means that is the range of the log function, negative infinity to infinity. So in other words, the logarithm function assumes all y values, all possible y values. The range of the exponential function was 0 to infinity. It was just the positive real numbers not including zero because the x-axis was a horizontal asymptote. That is the domain of logarithm functions. So log base b of x is the function. The domain is negative infinity or zero to infinity. So that means the x values that make up the domain, they must be only positive x values. Otherwise, those values are not in the domain of a logarithm function. So this means that the x coordinates or the x values for exponential functions become the y values of the log function and the y values of exponential function become the x values for the logarithmic function. So we're going to notice something that we discussed previously in the class. If you graph an exponential function and its inverse, then they should be symmetric or have a reflection across the line y equals x. So that's what we're going to be doing first in example six. Graph the exponential function two to the x. We did that in the previous section or the previous uh, section on exponential functions. We called this the doubling function. So if f of x equals 2 to the x is the exponential function, then log base 2 is the logarithmic function that's the inverse. So let's graph the exponential function first. Let's review what we were doing in the previous section. We made an xy table. We could choose any x value for the for x because the exponential function, the domain was all real numbers. So negative 3, negative 2, negative 1, 0, 1, 2, and 3. If you substitute these values into the exponent where the base is 2, you'll have uh, 2 to the negative 3, that is 1 eighth. 2 to the, 2 to the negative 2 power is 1 fourth. Base 2 to the negative 1 is 1 half. Notice that the values are doubling because it's the doubling function. Zero, 2 to the 0 is 1. 2 to the first power is 2. 2 squared is 4. And 2 cubed is 8. So let's graph this function first. So this is for f of x equals 2 raised to the x power. That's that table. So 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6. 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8. 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8. Okay. So negative 3, 1 eighth. So barely above the x-axis. 
negative 2 1 4 slightly above the x-axis negative 1 a half 0 comma 1 let's put that down here 1 comma 2 2 comma 4 and then 3 comma 8 and you should notice that this is what exponential functions look like exponential growth functions they are growing or increasing from left to right so this is 2 raised to the x power now this function didn't take that long because we're familiar with exponents let's make another xy table so that this time so that this time we can make an xy table for the logarithm function so this will be for g of x equals log base 2 of x notice that when uh, with our discussion in the previous page is that all the x values for the exponential function become the y values for the logarithm function and all the y values for the exponential function become the x values for logs so 1 8 1 4 1 half 1 2 4 8 are now the x values for the log function and the y values are negative 3 negative 2 negative 1 0 1 2 and 3 for the log function okay so if we graph these points 1 8 negative 3 barely to the right of the y-axis 1 fourth negative 2 1 half comma negative 1 1 comma 0 2 comma 1 4 comma 2 and then 3 comma or 8 comma 3 so now looks like the graph gets really close to the y-axis but does not touch the y-axis and then the function is also increasing as you go to the right and this was log base 2 of x notice that these two graphs are symmetric or reflections across the line y equals x which that's the property involving graphs of two inverse functions they are reflections of each other across y equals x so now we're going to talk more about the properties that we know about exponential function graphs and relate them to properties about logarithm function graphs so the graph on the left the one the graphs that are in blue are both exponential functions so this one is an exponential exponential growth function how do you know if it's a growth function the function is growing or increasing and the base must be greater than 1 so if the functions y equals b to the x the base must be greater than 1 to be a growth function so some properties that we realized um, in the previous section there is a y intercept 0 comma 1 there are no x-intercepts because you have a horizontal asymptote y equals 0 and the function is increasing so if you reflect this graph y equals b to the x across the line y equals x you get log base b of x where the base is greater than 1 so this is a logarithm function 
the function is still increasing, but you do not have any y-intercepts. So no y, no y-intercept because the y-axis is a vertical asymptote. You do, ha you do have a x-intercept, which is 1, 0. So notice the relationship between the two graphs. You had a horizontal asymptote y equals 0 for exponential functions. Because the x and the y swap roles, then you have a vertical asymptote x equals 0 for the log function. The y-intercept was 0, 1. The x-intercept is 1, 0 for log functions. There are no x-intercepts for exponential, but there is no y-intercepts for the log function. And both functions are increasing from left to right. On the other hand, if the base is less than 1 and greater than 0, this was called an exponential decay function. So base greater, greater than 0, but not any bigger than 1. So the function is decreasing from left to right. You still have a y-intercept 0, 1. And you still have a horizontal asymptote, um, y equals 0, and no x-intercepts. The log base b of x is the inverse, and this is where the base is less than 1, greater than 0. You have a vertical asymptote at x equals 0, so no y-intercepts. No y-intercept. And there is an x-intercept at 1, 0. So the same properties or same inverse properties show up in this set of two graphs. y-intercept for exponential function becomes the x-intercept for logs. The vertical asymptote for logs becomes the horizontal asymptote for exponential functions. No x-intercepts for exponential function. No y-intercept for log function. Okay, so we're going to summarize what we found out from these two sets of graphs for the characteristics of a logarithmic function. The domain of a log function, log base b of x, is the set of all positive real numbers, 0 to infinity. We have saw that before. The range of the log function is the set of all real numbers. So negative infinity to infinity. The graph of a logarithmic function passes through the point 1, 0, and that was the x-intercept. And there are no y-intercepts for a log function. If the base is greater than 1, the log function goes up from left to right, so it's increasing. If the base is between 0 and 1, then the function goes, or the graph goes down from left to right, and the function is decreasing. The logarithm function does not touch the y-axis or cross the y-axis. So the y-axis is a vertical asymptote, so x equals 0. So in example 7, we're going to find out how do you determine the domain without graphing. So number one, I'm going to do a few or a couple of these. f of x equals log base 4 of 3 subtract 2x. Okay, so what's inside the logarithm has a name. It's called the argument. The argument of the logarithmic function must be greater than 0. So if this was just x inside the logarithm, if the argument was just x, then the property says the domain of log base b of x is the set of all positive real numbers, so 0 to infinity. 
So what's inside the logarithm must be greater than 0. So 3 subtract 2x must be greater than 0. Not even equal to 0, just greater than 0, positive only. If you solve for x, solve this inequality for x, you get negative 2x is greater than negative 3. Then divide both sides of the inequality by negative 2, and re remember to reverse the direction of the inequality symbol. So x becomes less than 3 halves. So the domain in interval notation becomes negative infinity to 3 halves. Parenthesis, don't do not include 3 halves. Number 2, g of x equals 17, subtract log base 2 of 18x plus 6. So again, the argument of the logarithm must be greater than 0. Okay, that's the only thing we need to look for in terms of domain of a logarithmic function. So the 17, that's not the argument, so ignore it. Base 2, that does not determine the domain of a logarithm, so ignore it too. The argument is all that is important for us. So 18x plus 6 must be greater than 0. What's inside the logarithm? The argument. If you solve this inequality for x, 18x is greater than negative 6. Divide by positive 18, and x is greater than negative 1 third. So that means the domain written in interval notation is negative 1 third to infinity. So these two example or these two problems give us some examples on how to find the domain of a logarithmic function. So the last part of the section is about two special types of logarithms and some applications involving logarithm functions. So the logarithmic function where the base is 10 is called the common logarithmic function or just the common log. So typically, if you have log base 10 of x, it's assumed to be base 10 if you leave off the base because it's called the common logarithm. So log base 10, it's typically written as just log of x, and the base is assumed to be 10. Now you might recognize this on your graphing calculator or any scientific calculator. On the left-hand side, there's this button LOG. This is representing the common logarithm. So some properties that we have seen before about logarithms, but in terms of the common logarithm. Log base B of 1 was 0. So if the base is 10, this property becomes log of 1 is equal to 0. Log base b of b was 1 from the previous video. If its base is 10, it becomes log of 10, or log base 10 of 10 is 1. The inverse properties, log base b of b to the x is equal to x, so log base 10 of 10 to the x is x. Base b to the log base b of x is x. 10 to the log base 10 of x is x. So there are several real-life phenomena that start with rapid growth and then the growth level begins to level off. This type of behavior is modeled by logarithmic functions. So anytime that you're discussing intensity, earthquake intensity is what we're going to discuss in example 8, but sound intensity or even pH level in terms of in chemistry, 
they all use the common logarithm. So example 8, we're going to discuss the magnitude r, that's the function's name, of a Richter scale, on the Richter scale, of a earthquake's intensity is given by this logarithmic function that is base 10. r equals log base 10, because there is no base written, no subscript, of i divided by i sub 0. I sub zero represents the intensity, barely felt zero level earthquake. So on the surface of the earth, that would be the intensity I sub zero. The earthquake that destroyed San Francisco in 1906 was 10 to the 8.3 power times as intense as a zero level earthquake. What was the magnitude on the Richter scale for this earthquake in San Francisco? The 1906 San Francisco earthquake, it destroyed the entire city. It caused a fire, and the fire just, deter just destroyed the city after the earthquake. And this picture, it's, this is a picture of the San Andreas uh, fault line in California. You can see how the two uh, tecton tectonic plates are pushing up against one another to form this ridge. All right, so let's find the rector scale magnitude. The I is representing the intensity of the earthquake. It is 10 to the 8.3 times as intense as a zero level earthquake. Well, I sub zero is the intensity of a zero level earthquake. So I equals 10 to the 8.3 times I sub zero. Now let's use the formula for the Richter scale magnitude. R is log base 10 of I 10 to the 8.3 I sub zero divided by I sub zero. So notice that the i sub zeros are dividing by each other, so they cancel out. Log of 10 to the 8.3 is what's remaining. And this was a property that we just talked about in terms of the common logarithm. This is log base 10, because there is no subscript, so assume to be base 10, of 10 to the 8.3. So 8.3. Magnitude earthquake. So the San Francisco earthquake in 1906 was an 8.3 magnitude earthquake on the Rector scale. And then the last topic that we're going to discuss is the other type of um, special type of logarithm, and this is called a natural logarithm. It's a logarithm function where the base is the number e. And we talked about e in the previous section. So this type of logarithm with a base e is called the natural logarithmic function. And you might have recognized this one also on the calculator. So log base 10 is the LOG button, the log button. Right below it, you see ln. This represents the natural logarithm. So you'll nev you rarely see natural logarithm written log base e of x. So if the base is e, this is just den is denoted ln of x, and that's rep the ln represents natural logarithm. So again, let's talk about the four properties for logarithms that we've discussed, but this time in terms of the natural logarithm. Log base b of 1 is 0, so if the base is e, it becomes natural log of 1 equals 0. That's true. Log base b of b is 1, so if the base is e, it becomes natural log. So natural log of e is 1. Log base b of b to the x is x. That would be log base, uh, log base e of e to the x, so natural log of e to the x is x. 
and e to the log base e of x is x. So e to the natural log of x is x. All right, so the last example, we're going to go back and review how to find the domain. But this time, we're going to find the domain of a natural logarithmic function. So number one, the function is f of x equals natural log negative 5x plus 3 inside the natural log, then subtract 11. Okay, just like example 7, the argument of um, the natural logarithm function must be greater than zero. So we were not concerned with the base. The base did not determine the domain. Just the argument, what's inside the logarithm. So negative 5x plus 3 must be greater than 0. And if you solve for x, negative 5x is greater than negative 3. And then divide both sides by negative 5 and reverse the inequality. Because you divide by negative and you get x is less than 3 fifths. That means the domain in interval notation is negative infinity to three-fifths parentheses. All right, let's try one more. Number two. g of x equals three times natural log of two x subtract five divided by 2, that's inside the log, the natural log, and then plus 17 outside. So again, the 3 does not determine the domain, the base e does not determine it, nor does the 17. 2x minus 5 divided by 2 is the argument, and the argument of the natural logarithm function must be greater than zero. So 2x minus 5 divided by 2 must be greater than zero. So if we multiply both sides by the LCD, which is 2, positive 2, so do not reverse the inequality, the 2's will divide each other out, multiply by 2, divide by 2, and we'll have 2x minus 5 is greater than 0, or 2x is greater than 5, or x is greater than 5 halves. So the domain in interval notation would be 5 halves to infinity, not including 5 halves. So this finishes up our discussion on logarithmic functions, including the domain of a logarithm function, the graph of a log function, and then these two special types of logarithms. Base 10 is called a common logarithm, and base e is the natural logarithm. If you have any questions about any of the examples that we covered, please let me know. Or if you have any questions over any homework problem, please let me know that as well. And I'll see you at the next video when we discuss more properties of logarithms.